All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for catching us here. I'm Donnie Price with Elgato Fly Fishing Lodge. And today I'm talking with Brian O'Keefe. Uh, just in case you're not in the know, he's a renowned fly fishing photographer, writer, and angler. Um, Mr. O'Keefe, I appreciate you joining me here today. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great, Donnie. Nice to see you. Yeah, likewise, likewise. Haven't seen you in a very long time, almost a year. So. I should say I, I said nice to see you because we're on Zoom and your your people are thinking we're talking over the phone or something. But I can actually see the best haircut in fishing live this morning from this is this is Eastern, Eastern, Eastern Idaho. I get up, <clears throat> go work out, come back, take a shower, go to work, sort of a thing. It's it's just it does what it does. So I appreciate. Yeah. It. You're welcome. So what are you doing for fun right now? Well, that's an interesting question because it's about 26 degrees outside. I'm about an hour from Yellowstone and an hour from Jackson Hole. So I'm in that little corner of Idaho. And we're about a mile high here, but it's easy to get a little bit higher. Uh, for instance, Henry's Lake, where I really like to fish for those big cutthroats, is 6,500 feet. So it's getting cold. And for fun, um, well, I work for a company called Eleven Angling, and they just sent me to New Zealand for three weeks hmm. to check out this new lodge they bought called Owen River Lodge and and go to all the good, best fishing spots and take photos and meet the guides and the staff. And so 20-something days in New Zealand when it was getting cold here, that was fun, Donnie. But yeah. around here... Uh, there's still some fishing before things get really cold, mostly midges and blueing olives. But as you know, the Henry's Fork, South Fork of the Snake, the Teton, it's all world-class water. Mm -hmm. So I'll find something to do, but my bass fishing has shut down. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, do you have any tailwaters there that are exciting during the winter? Well, yeah, they're all kind of sort of tailwaters, but when they're frozen, it's not very exciting. Or they run slushy like a margarita. So you, you pick your days. If it can get up to 35 or 36, I'll go out. You know, boot foot waders and layers and layers. And, and you know, rising fish are still super cool. And if they're on a size 20 midge, I actually just love 6 and 7X fishing with, you know, a Griffith gnat and, and things like that. It's not all you know, checking the streamers or tarpon fishing and having fun like that. I really like that sort of techie dry fly fishing too. Yeah, I dig that as well. Um, there's a place that is probably about six and a half hours from my house here in Oklahoma. And uh, it's the White River. I'm mm -hmm. sure that you've heard of that in Arkansas. Yeah. And during the wintertime, whenever it's too cold to fish in Baja, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm chucking big streamers for, for yeah. brown trout. Um, and they're huge the brown trout. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're, they're big, they're big, but it's one of those deals. You've got to spend a lot of time to, to get them in, in that way. You know, you've got a lot, you got to really dedicate yourself to, you know, the difference between a good day and a bad day is just one tug, you know? And yeah, if you get that, then it's a great day. And if not, then you just, you basically just went a full day without a bite, but you, you really have to dedicate yourself to that type of fishing to be successful for it. But there's at any given day, you know, they're great midge pattern, uh, midge, midge hatches and um, all, all of that stuff. It's it's a very dynamic system. They're like 90 miles worth of fishable trout water there. So Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a it, 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 you, you would understand the midge fishing here then because there's about a two and a half, maybe three hour window when it's kind of warm enough that your fingers actually work. The bugs are up and on top fish are rising and you know you catch one or two and let them go and your fingers get wet and you know that's kind of it for the day yeah. and but it's still gorgeous you know there might be snow on the ground it looks like a christmas hallmark card but there's other reasons for going there you're driving by some of the best mexican food in idaho so there's an early dinner on the way home or you see your guide buddies up in places like ashton idaho or go go farther up to island park and just hanging out with buddies and and catching up and see what's going on in the winter and how everybody's family's doing you know that's fun fishing yeah two or three hours of good fun but then you tie it into two or three other things maybe a dump run you know it's all good 
Well, if uh, if you ever have the inkling to come down here, like in January, and and fish the streamers, I've I've got a system. So come on, it's an open invite for you anytime. That All you right, can. thank you. Uh, can you share your journey into the world of fly fishing and how you became involved in fly fishing photography and writing? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, well, it started out that I had no choice. My grandfather on my mother's side was a fairly well-known even you know in the 40s and 50s and 60s when they didn't have Instagram and there was only a couple of magazines really outdoor life and field and stream and things like that well my grandfather was a dry fly purist he lived in Missoula Montana and my brother and I would go over there for part of the summer and when we were old enough to fly cast not fly fish but he had us in this very serious ritual of learning to cast and learning where trout lived and what trout eat at the ages of eight nine and ten now if you remember the book a river runs through it by norman mcclain you know the super strict dad the two sons got into fly fishing with the 10 o'clock and two o'clock thing well that was my granddad long before the book came out and so my brother and I would cast on the rod. I'm sorry, we cast our fly rods on the lawn. And these were bamboo rods, uh, silk lines. And there, there might have been, you know, a plastic line when we started, but my granddad was real traditional. You, know, you stretch a silk line out between two trees and rub mucilin on it, and it'll kind of float, but boy, does it shoot. And, uh, so we got past the casting stage. Then we went with just these long cane poles, which you don't see in Montana or Idaho or Wyoming. That's really more of a Southern thing, but cane pole with some line, a hook and a grasshopper, real grasshopper. And so we would dab those around the boulders. And he taught us about where trout lived. And if it had a, you know, like an eddy with a big muddy, silty bottom, he says, no, nope, trout don't like this. They like rocks and bugs. And so we dab around and we would catch a few nice fish in the in the big blackfoot river and then the third year we actually cast our fly rods with a joe's hopper dry fly mm -hmm. into places that we'd learned had trout and so he had a, a nice slow but effective progression of skills and knowledge and so by the age of 11 or 12 i was a pretty good caster um catching fish left and right I didn't tell my granddad, but I also did some spin fishing for bass and, and other things back home and salmon and steelhead. I was really getting into that because I grew up in the state of Washington. I, I moved to Oregon where I spent 45 years after um, after high school and traveling around with a backpack going to New Zealand and all these places as a kid. Ended up in Oregon and then I started fishing all tackle, but I still had my dry fly roots. And uh, you know, I was just sort of, you know, I mean, it's almost a bad word now, groomed. My my grandfather wanted another fly angler in the family. My brother was good at it, but he just had aspirations that were different than mine. I was fine being a ski bum and a trout bum, and that sounded good to me. My brother went on to be a very successful dentist and all that, but he's still a very good angler. And, um, and so the photography part is really kind of a crazy story. I, I'll try to keep it brief, but... It, it's uh okay so i'm a kid probably uh 13 14 i've got typical kid you know things like fibbing or lying a little bit to get out of trouble you know if something broke john did it mm -hmm. and uh of course i got caught every time but my brother and my mother because my father was kind of out of the picture he was kind of a loser <laughs> and uh anyway my brother and my mother had these little secret meetings to discuss my my problem with honesty and it really wasn't any different than any little kid i was just trying to not always get caught so they decided to buy me the kodak instamatic which was the fir first point and shoot camera remember you would wind the film a bunch and, mm -hmm. and it was a uh, you know a little, little cassette of film would go in the back it was super simple first point and shoot camera and uh, that was in the late 60s and then because I would tell them about all these stories of these big bass I would catch and I would let them go because I didn't want to bring them back on the handlebars of my bike. So they thought I was kind of making up my story about these big bass.
remember one time on this one river there was a there was a rapids and there was some bears there and Val would say yeah just walk back there I need to get the bears in the background you know just kind of sacrificing me in case something went wrong but we just had a blast and then uh I think everybody sort of develops their own style and even to the extent that I find myself I, I sort of get stuck in a rut I, I know what shots I do really well they're kind of bank mm -hmm. and I I have to sort of force myself to okay we've been doing that for 30 years let's do something else sure. but uh yeah it was fun and you know we all got along and there wasn't any email or anything but we would see each other at big shows some on the east coast some on the west coast some in denver and we would i get to see barry and kathy back or i get to see val or i get to see these other guys and god we were just like the best of friends because we knew there wasn't any money in it but we sure liked doing it and we got to go to some cool places sure very cool well um you know you, you've fished with a lot of interesting people um What's the most interesting person you've ever fished with? Oh, man, I might have needed a little warning for this one, but. <laughs> if you had warning, you, I mean, where's the fun in that? Yeah, that's right. I would, I, you're right. Okay. Point Donnie. Um, I, I've fished with famous people. So I'll start there. Like Ted Williams, the famous baseball player. And he's a, a great angler. And we had a great time. But I had heard he's very hard on guides, like really rough and gruff and not the most friendly person around guides if you're messing up or stuff. But I had him for a week and we had a jet boat and we we're going to fly into these different river systems that had boats stashed on him. And we were going to just go for it, do it. He was with a buddy from Maine. And uh, <clears throat> but knowing you know who he was i owned a baseball encyclopedia i knew all his stats and all this stuff so i i, I brushed up on his baseball history and i also knew his fishing history because in spring training he would fish bonefish and tarpon in florida mm -hmm. and then of course he loved atlantic salmon in, in canada but so i found a stick um maybe you know 40 inches long and i I whittled it and whittled it and whittled on it until I made an actual quite realistic bat. And I kept that in the back of my jet boat for sometimes bonking a big salmon for a guest that wanted to either eat it or take it home. And for personal protection, you never know, it might jump out of the woods. And to bring it out when Ted Williams got there. And so about day three, we'd gotten to know each other pretty well. We were getting along and and I figured, well, here we go. You know, we stopped at a gravel bar for lunch and pulled the pulled the boat out. We got out. And I got some sandwiches and the thermos, and and then we're just hanging out. I go, hey Ted, check this out. And I brought out the bat, and he looked at that. And actually, I can remember this. He had like a sandwich in one hand and a fly rod in the other with a hardy reel on it, and he literally just let it go and dropped it in the rocks. Didn't even place it down carefully. Dropped it stomped over to me grabbed that bat and then started looking for just the perfect rocks to hit and he would just toss them up and smash them i'm not kidding so he was oh he's probably in his 60s then he wasn't as old you know he lived for quite a while but anyway he could still smash rocks across the river it was a mind-blowing thing and he goes here you do it oh great so I pick up a roll. I probably whiffed three or four times. I, you know, clicked one into the water. And he goes, no, here's what you do. It's on the hips. First of all, it's in your eyes. You have to see the ball come. You got to see the rotation of the ball. Then it's, it's in your hips and everything follows your hips. Just kind of like in golf, you know, it's hips and boom. And he gave me, you know, elbow here, boom. He gave me this personal Ted Williams batting lesson mm -hmm. in our waders on a river in Alaska. And, oh God, that was just so cool. Um, and then at the lodge back in those days, you know, they had little boom boxes and it wasn't all digital and wireless and Bluetooth and stuff. So I had a cassette boom box. I played music in my little cabin and, and I brought it in to record Ted Williams. I secretly got it down below the table and put in a, a new cassette and I, you know, dinner started and I clicked record, just let it roll. But then knowing his baseball history from the baseball encyclopedia, I brought up some statistics, like the time he struck out five times in a row, which only happened to him once against the Cleveland Indians. 
And he would go F and F, F, F and F, that F and F and F and pitcher, blah, blah, blah. And he was, he was a man's man. I mean, gruff, tough guy, plaid wool shirt, holes in the elbows, and very, very opinionated. And he would go on and on and throw out these little statistics just to get him going. And he got just was going nuts. I had this classic interview with Ted Williams that he did not know about. And well, the sad part of it is a couple of years later, I was recording, <laughs> I was recording some tunes because I had a little homemade weight room in my house. I was gonna have some blasts of music while I was working out. And I and I recorded over Ted Williams oh. with Michael Jackson's thriller album, oh. which was pretty good, you gotta admit. I mean, you gotta back get, in the day. If you're gonna tape but, it or something, uh, yeah. Not a bad choice, right? Well, yeah. So poor Ted. I could have given that tape to, you know, baseball hall of fame, I don't know, or ESPN, who knows what. But anyway. And then, uh, you know, that I, I guided Bob Hope and really Weisskopf and all sorts of hockey players and all that stuff. And But my most interesting people weren't celebrities, and I don't even remember their names anymore. But I remember a doctor from L.A. who was just so funny and corny. Yeah. And I showed him a silver salmon fly, and I said, now this one, don't lose it because it's made of polar bear hair. And it was, you know, white, polar bears are white, but it was dyed bright orange for silver salmon. And it probably had $5 worth of polar bear on there. So I didn't want him to lose it. And he looked at it so weird. And he said, I thought polar bears were white. And he was serious. I thought, well, the doctor, he's a smart guy, but maybe not in real life things, but just fun people. I just think that, you know, fly fishing, fishing in general, bird hunting, all that stuff, doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. If you're a nice person and you're good at what you do, you know, we bond instantly. You know, women can't be friends for 10 years. They're always at each other. And guys will just go, hey, I have that shotgun. And then you're best friends. You know, it's so easy. But uh, yeah, there's just a lot of fun people and interesting people. Meet them all the time. It's just it's just the best part of our business. Yeah. Well, speaking of interesting people, we have actually somebody that uh, we have a common friendship with. How do you know Rick Hartman? Wow, that's great. Well, he's, first of all, he's such an easy guy to like. And two, how I met him, well, we met at fly, distance fly casting competitions. Mm -hmm. and And Rick is, in my opinion, I mean, there's Steve Ray, Jeff, and everybody else. But when Rick is on his game, Rick's pretty hard to beat. He's got the most classic style. He's very athletic. He was a good football player. He was a very fast runner, and he's built like a bulldog. So when when Rick was on his game, it was a thing of beauty. And I remember one time, it was Steve Ray, Jeff, and me and Rick kind of in this shootout. And Rick could have won, except he went out of bounds because it was a narrow shooting lane where you had to cast down. You know, and he, he went out of bounds with a five weight floating line, probably about 110 to 115 feet. Mm -hmm. And so that bumped me up into the finals with Steve Ray, Jeff, world's best caster ever, yeah. and super good guy also. <clears throat> So, you know, I think you get three shots and one of mine, the backing did a little flippy thing and, and wrapped around the stripping guide and stopped my cast at about 80 feet. Hmm. I just turned and looked at Rick and said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, he should have been there, not me. Oh. But I mean, I hucked at 107 and then, then Steve Ray Jeff checked it out there at 117 or 18. Yeah. It's just a beautiful thing to watch, but we were all just, birds of a feather love to fish love the art of casting and uh and rick is a character as you know and then i got to fish with him so i fished uh, south padre island area uh, for redfish um he joined me on a photo trip to casablanca lodge mm -hmm. in the yucatan on ascension bay but i think 
Oh yeah, we went bass fishing in Texas and stuff. But anyway, great guy, such a cool personality and such a talent. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And probably <clears throat> the thing that the, I really enjoy about him, <clears throat> pardon me, the thing that I enjoy about him the most is he's, you know, he's a he's a big guy, right? And he works out like daily and does all the stuff and all that. But <clears throat> it's more than that. It's it's the precision and the grace of of what he he does as well right I, I only got to meet him like last year but we've we've become pretty good friends i, I really think a lot of him. so very cool yeah whenever i hear the name rick hartman i remind myself i gotta call that guy I, yeah. I mean he's such a neat dude but we only talk two or three times a year and it's always fun and i, and I just one of these days i'll just cash in some miles and pop in and knock on his door you know he's one of those guys just just a blast to be around for sure. He's busy now. He's he's pretty busy. He guides a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> Probably more than he should. But um yeah, he's he's fun. He's fun to fish with too. He's he knows his stuff. He's he's a good captain. Yeah. His sense of humor is top notch. <laughs> it can get a bit dark, but I enjoy <laughs> that myself. So um you shot my favorite fly fishing picture of all time, uh the the Scott jet ski picture. First, tell us the story of the shoot. And secondly, how did this concept come to be? But how did you think of that? Well, I was a sales rep from about age 31 or 32 for 22 or 23 years. And it was kind of my, if I have a career, that's actually what I would call it my career because I did it over 20 years. Then it worked for everybody. And Scott Rods was one of the companies I worked for. And it was a fun company. It was in the Bay Area at the time. And we'd all fly in for meetings and test new rods and have so much fun. Then it moved to Colorado where it is now. And at these meetings, you know, we'd all chime in about different things, marketing and sales and pricing and color of the blanks and just tons of things. It was really fun, really hands-on company, um, no fluff. It was just fish bums talking. And I remember we were doing some posters and, you know, it was like, okay, what, what should we do? Let's get some posters in some fly shops. And we thought about it for a while. And I, I sort of raised my hand and said, Hey, uh, let's, you know, cause right then there was this controversy in the keys. Jet skis were just becoming kind of a thing. And they were just zooming around the flat, scaring the fish. The guides hated them. I mean, that's putting it mildly. Yeah, And so I said, well, let's do a thing where we have like a guy in a skiff on a flat in Florida hooking a jet skier. <laughs> and of course, everyone's like, yeah, that's so cool. And we did others that were fun, too. And uh, you know what? Everybody liked the idea. So we flew to Florida. A couple guys hired a guy that was sort of a Scott pro. And then our sales manager was the guy running the jet ski. And so as, a, as a, I'm an employer, I'm, well, I'm not really an employee, I'm a private contractor, but he's my boss as far as, you know, doing your job. Sure. And so not too often can you, you know, you, you tie the fly the leader to the back of his life jacket. There's no hook. He comes zooming by with the boat in the background, the guy with the bent rod, the guy, the guy on the pulling platform has got his fist raised going, yeah, like kill him, you know. And so when he zooms by, I give a big, huge bend in the rod and he leaps off the thing and really high in the air. And then at full speed, crashes in the water. Oh, no, I didn't have the rod. The guy in the boat had the rod. I have the camera. Sorry, I got way off track there. So I'm in the water, waist deep. We were talking about bull sharks earlier when we just, minute, yeah, there were bull sharks around there too. It was pretty stupid. But so I'm getting the picture. This guy's yanking him off from the bow of the skiff. and. He's crashed in the water. And I would say, you know, it was filmed. So I can't look at the camera and say, yeah, that one's perfect. I said, well, let's just keep doing a few more. And because he was my boss, I added a few more because it was sort of like, you know, running back, running into the defensive line of a pro team. And when you hit that water at 30 miles an hour, I mean, he just splats. So I made him splat a few extra times. Then we ended up getting just the right shot. And that that was actually kind of a classic in, in fly fishing very memorable and i was doing a fly fishing show in seattle 
and this guy comes by the booth. I was probably with Sims or Patagonia or Orvis or Scott or someone at the time, who knows, but uh, the guy sees my name tag and goes, Brian O'Keefe, are you the guy that took that jet ski poster shot? And I said, well, yeah, I am. Thanks for remembering that. He goes, yeah, I teach advertising at the University of Washington. I use that poster in my class to show people how effective this shot is because if you know what you're looking at, you'll just go, yeah, that is so cool. And there's not that many, yeah, that is so cool moments in opening a magazine or a poster or seeing a billboard on the side of the highway. So he he thought that was just the coolest thing. And yeah, it all comes full circle. It's pretty neat. Yeah, very cool. Well, it's very influential for me. The first actual fly fishing job that I ever got was a um, working at a fly shop in Oklahoma City of all places, right? So, um, you know, I've I've fly fished in Alaska. I lived there for seven years. I got it there um, after I worked at that shop never even really thought about anything like that until until then but yeah i would walk in and see that every day and be like man i love this place yeah, yeah. so much well, more than just marketing for a rod it, it was it was uh kind of a movement for the time really yeah it was a little political undertone what was the name of the fly shop in oklahoma city river's edge river's edge so that was a big popular shop yeah it, i mean for for okies yeah but yeah. Uh, yeah, we've we've got a pretty good following of, of fly fishermen here. Um, obviously, a lot of bass fishermen, some trout fishermen, people that travel a lot. You pretty much have to travel if you want to do anything cool, you know, fly fishing in Oklahoma. So, um, you know, Dave Whitlock was from here. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you can't really uh, downgrade it too much. But first thing he did in his career was move to Arkansas. So. <laughs> oh, really? But whenever he retired, he came back. So Yeah. Yeah. yeah neat guy very very talented yeah i never got to fish with him that's a big big regret of mine but um yeah wish i could have at least hung around with him on the water one day so yeah that would be good um we talk about the differences in then versus now uh with like technology for cameras and things like that um what do you think technology has done to the world of fly fishing photography? Not necessarily just with the cameras, you know, the cameras are, are much better now, but um, like with social media and uh, being able to share and, and do all of that stuff. Yeah. First of all, I always substitute brag for the word share, but <laughs> well, you know, that's such a huge question because technology has affected every aspect of our life from our cars to our, you know, our appliances and all that stuff. So cameras evolved just like everything else to the point where they're pretty tricky. I mean, they do so many different things. Now, you, you we have real cameras and then we have our phones. Which are pretty so our Phones have made photography the most common activity outside of walking. So you use your phone every day, all day for all its different you know, things that it can do. And as a camera, after about, I'll just speak in iPhone terms. I don't know the other brands that well, but after about the iPhone 8, man, the camera got good. And then the, the 12, spectacular. And I've, I've got the 14 and it's really a quality camera. I've, I have a little housing that it goes into for underwater shots and they're stunning. I've had a couple covers on Fly Fisherman uh -huh. and they if it passes that test you know it's pretty good even not that i'm a subscriber or anything but as a as a little anecdote the vogue magazine one of the most popular magazines in the world has used iphones for its cover and they'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on their cover uh -huh. and you know you walk up click nailed it nailed let's it. go have lunch you know so everyone's got a camera because they have a phone and that's just made photography universally popular and as you said you can share them you can use them uh you know in flyers and blogs and all these different things so it's made people who would normally be say i'm 69 and if you're a little older than me you might be a little bit of a curmudgeon about computers and technology and phones and all this stuff because we just weren't raised with it there were no computers when i went to college or high school or anything like that well, there probably were, you know, in IBM or something, but nobody had one. So 
some of these curmudgeon guys are now having so much fun with their phones to take pictures of their fish, bugs, the weather, their bird feeders, and all this stuff. It's really expanded photography from four-year-olds to 90-year-olds, and that's really pretty cool. And, you know, I think back, okay, you probably did all these different sports, and I did too, so I I was a really pretty good gymnast and springboard diver and a soccer player. I didn't do traditional sports, even though I really liked baseball. And I did a little pole vault. But you know what? I don't have any pictures of that stuff. I went to national championships in, in trampoline of all things. I don't have one picture. Think of the kids today. If they were in at a high school meet, their parents would have 100 pictures from just that day. Yeah. So I think it's neat that everybody can have a, a really well-documented life and not have to just tell their nieces and and their friends' kids, like, oh, yeah, I used to do backflip on skis. And they go, yeah, right, Brian, sure. I have, no, you know, no pictures. It's neat that people have all these things filled in throughout their life of all their, you know, sports and medals and, you know, being on the debate team or whatever. I think it's really cool. Now, your base, basic pro camera, that's gotten just out of control as far as technology, you know, mirrorless and all these different, the size of the mem mem memory and the size of the sensors. Well, like photos have gotten from good to better to best, so has the camera technology. And, and, and I, you know, I was down in New Zealand working, uh, taking pictures and all. A friend of mine went with me who was doing drone and, and, and he had you know, this latest and greatest camera and a 500 millimeter lens he was doing these little tweety birds and stuff and it was so tack sharp so amazing um, even though good glass has been around for a long time german optics and japanese optics have always been fantastic but just the ease of it now of slinging it up boom getting a bird in flight or you don't have to do any adjustments and all that so i think it's made it a lot easier it's not cheap to have the very best, but man, the results are incredible. You look like a pro on day one. For sure. Yeah. I'm going to share with you a picture real quick of uh, the last time that I was fly fishing on a, on a good trip, which was Costa Rica. And uh, the guy that owns the lodge that I was at uh, requested a, a special photo. This is just in my Lightroom, but I will share the screen real quick. Uh, I've got a picture of a howler monkey. Um, it, it's it's kind of a ginger color, um, <laughs> but the the guy told me that he has a friend that uh, that he likes to offend, so he sends him pictures of monkeys' testicles, but. I had a, a big five, 500 millimeter lens and like you can count the freckles on this monkey's testicles. I'll, I'll send it to you after this. And uh, I'll also put it in the, in the notes of, of this deal so that, uh, so that others can, can see it as well if they, if they would like. Well, with that lead lead up, uh, I just can't wait, Donnie. I just, you know, I'm a real freckle counter. Yeah, it's, uh, it's 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 impressive. I'm looking at it right now, and then I'm looking at you, and then I'm looking at it. And I'm looking. But yeah, it was the things that you see and the things that you do on these trips are are uh, they're priceless, just priceless. Yeah, yeah that's so true. Anyway, getting back on uh, on topic here. Sorry about the rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> So you've been to a lot of different places. What's your favorite? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, well, let me define favorite first because my best fishing trips have been because of the people. Either I was with or guide or local community, whether it's in Africa, South America, Alaska, or Oregon, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho. So some of my favorite places are because I was with such neat people. And we can all relate to that. 
and we also have been on trips where well there wasn't so many neat people you know and uh that's just human personalities but when you combine good people with good weather because you know you can go to the best trout fishing in the world or the best tarpon place in the world and have horrible weather it's it's just that close from being your best fishing trip ever so there's a little bit of a variable um but when it's all said and done, the combination of people, food, scenery, and fishing, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to have a tie. It's a tie between southern Chile and the Patagonia area and 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 New Zealand. It's just they're just so beautiful. People are great, food's great. Kind of a long flight to get to, um, but the, the new planes now are really not that bad <clears throat> they're comfortable even in back in the cheap seats but uh, yeah the fishing is remarkable i like the style of fishing in new zealand which is where you stalk along and, and creep along and you spot a big fish you usually have a guide or another angling companion direct you where to make the cast and and it's teamwork that you see that big thing out there and foot and a half of water you make a good cast and it'll do its part and take the fly if you do your part wrong it'll drift off in the deep water never to be seen again so i like that kind of technical fishing in new zealand in crystal clear water some of the most amazing scenery in the world and then in chile you know big rivers lots of big fish no fishermen around i mean chile just doesn't have a history of of fly fishing in particular that just isn't really done there's a there's a fly shop in a couple towns and one in santiago but you get way out in the boonies and you'll fish this beautiful water never see another boat never see another angler that's just pretty cool yeah. when people say it's like you know wyoming 65 years ago it's sort of true yeah. and uh, so i liked it that almost on any given cast you might catch a 30 inch brown and then you're catching 15 to 20 inches on a semi-regular basis to keep you going. And those are great fish anywhere. Yeah. But then you're looking at the Andes and these glaciers and it's just spectacular. Um, but then I'd probably have a tie for second place too with Alaska, Brazil for peacock bass, Argentina for golden Dorado. And then of course, flats fishing. Jeez. It's all pretty good, Donnie. <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff out there. Yeah. There's uh it's interesting you say ties because I, I don't really think that I can point a finger to one particular place. I've been asked that before and I've never really had a very good answer for it. I've thought about it and still, you know, to date, I, I can't really say of all the places that I've been to, I like this spot right here the best. Baja ranks up there. It's a that's yeah. It's a pretty silly fishery, but, um, yeah. you know, as far whenever you take in everything to account, not just the fish, but yeah, there, I don't, I don't know that I could even limit it to, to 10. It's really hard. And, you know, I moved here in Idaho to be close to several really good rivers. And I have to say that the Henry's Fork would probably be, if I was limited to one fishery, well the best thing would be to have one warm winter fishery and then have one summer fishery in north america so i i go a little crazy if i don't see at least or fish the henry's fork in three days after three days i get a little weird gotta go check it out see the cycle of the bugs what the fish are doing the level of the water that sort of thing so yeah it gets to you it becomes really just a lifestyle part of your life and yeah. I'm glad I got it bad. For sure. So um fly anglers fly, fly anglers um often have a deep respect for nature and a commitment to conservation. Um can you talk about the importance of conservation in fly fishing and how do you promote the ethos of of uh, of this through your work? Yeah, well, you know, it's a never ending battle. You know, we've had pebble mine going on for over 10 years and it's it starts to feel like a victory, but then something sneaks around the backside and 
works at something else again. You just never give up. Um, the Boundary Waters in Minnesota, constantly you know, under siege by these mining interests. And, and there's just some places that are just too cool. Just leave them alone. Let it just be real nature. And um, But they're never ending battles. And I, and I think the, the key right now is to sort of pass the baton. If, if you look at a lot of the guys in fly clubs, they're, they're almost aging out. They're in their 70s to 80s, and they're doing a ton of conservation work, grassroots projects, planting willows, taking down fences, and you know, doing the stuff that these great organizations like Trout Unlimited, Fly Fishing International, and, and all sorts of other groups. So it's passing the baton to have river keepers and have people coming up behind us. And another aspect of it is, well, you know, I chose to be kind of a ski bum and a fishing bum, and I've had some okay jobs and stuff, but I'm not a rich guy. So I can't write Trout Unlimited a check for 50 grand here and there and, and stop Pebble Mine, but I can do what I can do. And I think everybody has something that they can do. So I donate photos and give talks and presentations for these different groups. So if I, let's just take no pebble mine. I will make a PowerPoint about the beauty and actually the ground that pebble mine would go on because I guided that area, the Copper River and others. And then they can start a function, a fundraiser or something with this PowerPoint. It shows everybody how pretty it is, the amazing amount of sockeye salmon, the wildlife, the bears, the eagles, the natives, the native fishermen, and tie it all together in a nice little package. They can just plug it in and everywhere they go. And I've done my little part, you know, because that's what I do. And I do that with oh dozens of different organizations. And it's my little way of saying, let's get it done, you know. And and I think if you're a good writer or you're even a lawyer i mean you can always use your skills and talents to to a benefit it's just not about you know giving money which is obviously very important but uh supporting those groups through even a minimum uh membership some are 35 dollars a year there's auctions online auctions where you can buy really cool tackle and trips at sometimes discounted prices and i think there's just lots of ways to be active in it without being you know in, in a national or international presence you can do stuff grassroots from a little town in idaho but do but be dealing with the florida keys with stripers in on the east coast with smallmouth bass in, in the in the uh the uh in minnesota the boundary waters so it's everywhere it's dams on the snake river i mean we just open any fishing magazine there's something going on anywhere and all over the world so i think it's a mainly just channeling what an individual can do and can contribute and uh, be creative, get to know a few people in those organizations and uh, just all do our part. Sure. Yeah. That's a great answer. It's like everybody has something that they can do. And I think that, I think that, um, I think that that's good to exemplify because people look at giants as such as yourself and think, you know, you could do a lot of good, but I think with today's connectivity, especially with, uh, you know, social media out, um, outposts and things of things of that. I mean, we're more connected now than what we've ever been. And people have a lot more power just in the individual than what they realize. Yeah. yeah and in every community there's, and not just fly fishing clubs, but other organizations that if they don't have a bunch of cash or they don't have, you know, a skill that not necessarily is applicable to a project, you, know, you just have yourself. You can go volunteer. And I, I do with my local fly clubs. It's fun. You, I mean, we just did a litter pickup the other day and I rented one of those uh, construction site magnets. You know, it's about three feet wide with the wheels on the end because some of the boat ramps had been built on sites that had buildings on them in the past, but they leveled the building. And there's just nails everywhere. And, and guides in particular, we're getting all these flat tires. So I rented the nail pickup magnet and just ran it up and down like a lawnmower. And, and I picked up, I don't know, a five gallon bucket, almost all full of nails and spikes and all kinds of stuff. Wow. You know, it took me four hours out of my life, but that was with the Henry's Fork Foundation. And we just did a beautiful job of going up and down the river, 
keeping it as beautiful and pristine as possible. And, and I just hate flat tires. They're like the bane of my existence. So I was the nailed guy. But so, you know, anybody could have done that. It, it maybe cost me $15 to rent that magnet. But, you know, the long run, you know, flat tires are nasty. <laughs> so, you know, it, you know, I think everybody can do that one little thing here and there. Yeah. So I've spoken a lot about your photography and you've done great things with that in the past. And I don't want to diminish from that, but you've also done some writing. So as a writer, your articles often delve into the technical aspects of fly fishing. Um, can you share some of the insights into your writing process and how you communicate these technical details uh, to kind of a broad audience? Yeah, that that happened by accident. I think when you do a lot of photography, you're then sort of committed to do some captioning of photos. And then one thing leads to another to maybe a full, um, like big photo essay with an introduction and, and some little storyline stuff throughout a photo essay. The next thing you know, you're doing an article and, and um, it just happens. And, and I, you know, I actually enjoyed English and writing in high school and college. A lot of people didn't. I actually kind of liked it. Uh, maybe it was because I'm a bit of a rambling talker. I just kind of get going and don't stop. And so maybe I appreciated you know, good storytelling. So I started doing more writing. And I got a, from editors and people at work. I got sort of the same response a lot. And I would say, oh, clean this up, edit it with a sledgehammer. These are my original thoughts, but I'm not, you know, they're not set in stone. Make it nice. And they go, well, but Brian, we, we like your folksy style. And I went, oh, I have a folksy style, which means not pretentious or not, lots of big words for the sake of big words, but just nice flow, easy to understand and, and sort of, you know, down home. And so whether you, let's just keep this kind of in the category of fly fishing, whether you're a fly tire, a caster, you've really gotten dialed into bass fishing, all of those take practice. And, you know, fly tying, can you imagine our first flies ever fishing with them now? I mean, oh my God, they were so horrible. But you practice and you get better and you get better at casting and you get better at, say, bass fishing or steelhead fishing or flats fishing. Your first time was... You know, probably okay, but you sure learned a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. So writing is the same way. It's it's something that you get better and better at. You know, you develop kind of a style, and then you kind of fall back on some of your favorite terms and sequences, how you tie things together, and, and it's a skill. And some people are real naturals, and, and a lot of magazine editors, um, copywriters, and that's the thing. I've, I've just, it's part of their... DNA. They're just really good with words. Other people are good with numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, not being you know a trained professional, I just like photography. You go from good to better to best. I just started doing it more and it became more easy. And when things become more easy, they become more fun. So I, I actually enjoy a little project now when someone says, hey, I need 500 words on Arctic char in Alaska or something or on grayling or on baby tarpon. So now I don't, now I'm not afraid of that stuff. Like, oh God, what am I going to, how am I going to do it? You know, it's just sort of, it's easy because I'm loose. I used to be, I found that two glasses of wine really are the perfect, you know, like playing pool, you know, two beers, you're pretty darn good. Four beers, you're really bad. <laughs> so, but two glasses of wine, I think just loosen you up a little bit, take off a few sharp corners and things just kind of flow. And, and so like everything I've done, I've, never was meant to be in anything you know except my brother's little brother to beat up so i think you just get into it and strive to do the best you can do and, and doing it a lot and, and repetition makes it easier and then it makes it fun have you written a storybook define storybook book of your stories stories of oh no and I've been told that I probably should, but it would definitely cut into my fishing. And I'm thinking of myself as just another dude in this industry, if you can call it that, just another guy that's waving 
a stick in the air. I never wanted to be important or anything. I mean, it's just sort of happened by accident. And yeah, because I was in the right place at the right time. And I did get pretty good at the picture taking stuff. And then people see your name and then they recognize you in the show. So uh, I don't know. Um, if it was super easy, I would do it because then I could do a photo and you know story book kind of thing. I think it'd be fun. There are two things. And I'm getting old enough that might be you know interesting to like. I might sell a hundred copies. Oh, you'll sell more than that. I'll I'll buy I'll buy some too. Um, I want to see two things from you. I want to see number one those pictures of you whenever you were a kid of your of your pictures, and I want to see that illustrated in that book that I was just talking about. I think that would be glorious. But yeah, I've got I've got pictures of me bass fishing. I had black hair and a huge afro. And uh, well, that was the seven sixties and seventies. Everybody had long hair, big hair. And man, I'll send you a picture. You will not recognize me. I, oof, I was out there, but uh, but we all were. And you know what? I had this giant hair and a beard, and backpack. You know, going around the world trout fishing and stuff. And when I was nineteen twenty, and then came back to try my hand at college, and. I looked pretty freaky, you know, and and so now when I see young kids and they're, they look kind of you know, odd or weird, yeah. I, I cut them a little slack and just say, you know, you know, back in the day, they wouldn't ever think I had a big long afro and a beard and stuff, but, you know, I cut them a little slack and think that, you know, they could be just fine. They could grow up, have great jobs, be good parents and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, yeah, I'm pretty pretty easy going on the younger generation but you know this is the first beard that i've ever been allowed to grow oh ever. wow well it fits my whole That's movie star <laughs> it's far from movie star. maybe uh like in a horror film or <laughs> something like that no um i've always either been military or paramedic or firefighter i just recently retired so this is this is going to get out of hand rather quickly Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it fits you well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I, I think that uh, your face fits you well too. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, let's see. I, I think that I think that we've gotten just about everything. Um, as a, as sort of a wrap up, can you recommend some of your favorite books or magazines or online resources for fly fishing enthusiasts? Wow, there's a ton. Um, I I really enjoy, you know, what's left of our magazine industry. So that would be you know the Drake Magazine, Fly Fisherman Magazine, American Fly Fishing, and Gray Sporting Journal. Those are all loaded with great articles. Some are really fun and some are very instructive. instructive. Um, boy, and then on online, I mean, someone will say, you know, you taught me that uni knot, but I forgot how to do it. When you combine two lines together, I go, just go Google uni knot and you'll have 10 animated slow motion ways of doing knots. I mean, that's a never ending resource. And then, um, you know, Orvis has Tom Rosenbauer's podcast, which he sometimes dives into technique. Um, they, they've always got interesting people on there and a lot of great information. And in books, you know, I've I've heard, I don't know how absolutely factual this is, but it makes sense is that fly fishing is the most written about sport in the world, more than auto racing, more than football, baseball, but you don't even think about it when you you see what is fly fishing in literature. Well, it's bugs, it's casting, it's travel, um, it's stories. And, you know, you go in the library and you'd be surprised how many books on fly fishing there are and how few there are on equestrian or, you know, car racing and all that sort of stuff. So there is just thousands and thousands of good books out there. And, and one in particular called the Curtis Creek Manifesto. It's quite old and it's a, a good book for beginners because it's kind of done in a cartoon format, but it really 
touches on all the bases for a beginning angler to check out. And uh, author is Sheridan Anderson. And then, geez, there's just so many others. I mean, there's the fun books by John Gerak. There's the yeah. technical books on you know everything from Euronymphing to every species of you know bonefish, redfish, tarp, and privet all have beautiful, nice books. So I I couldn't actually make a list in my mind right now, but I know when people want to expand their knowledge in the sport, they've just fantastic and wonderful opportunities through the internet and through even just library. Um, I ordered a book from a used bookstore. It just came the other day from Zane Gray. You know, a lot of younger people don't know Zane Gray, but he was a classic Western writer and he was a big time fisherman. And he wrote a book called Angler's El Dorado. And I knew about it and I may have even read it 30, 40 years ago but it's set in New Zealand. So when I went to New Zealand a month ago and had this incredible experience, it reminded me, I've got to get Zane's book, hit the computer in eight minutes. It was bought and ordered. And in two days it was here, you know, 17 bucks. And it's a, it's really a super classic of early fishing in New Zealand. And uh, so we have the world at the palm of our hand just by typing in a Google search. And that information is, you know, like everything, it it's also got good, better, best, but the best stuff is incredibly good. Uh -huh. Have you ever read a book called The River Why? Oh yeah, one of my favorite. Yeah, David James Duncan, and set on the Oregon coast, and yeah, and I really could see myself in that book at times because I fished the Oregon coast after my classes in high school when I was in my senior year in Portland, Oregon. So I fished a lot of those rivers. I'm trying to figure out which one was the river why. And uh, that was a great book. It it should leave a lasting impression on you. For sure. You know, it was probably a quarter of that book that I had gotten through and before I realized that it was fiction. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm that idiot. Like I was believing it. Like, oh yeah, okay. That, so that went on. Okay. That, that's kind of weird. <laughs> this is a little yeah. bit too far. What is this a non-fiction book it, yeah. <laughs> there was a there was a philosophical difference in me after after i read that book like i had to kind of put down fly fishing for a little while and and figure some things out it was uh it was that was a that was a very influential book for me yeah it was for a lot of people and it's in in our world i would say if you asked a hundred people 50 or more would put it in their top five favorite books and it, it is, it is in a way sort of life-changing if a book can be that way. It's, it opens up your eyes to an interesting way to look at things. And his characters were great. And I was lucky because I lived, you know, 75 miles from the setting of most of that book. And, and then I was the Orvis rep and, and the character's name was Gus Orviston, you know, so it was really a good connection to me. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. That's a, that's a classic. Yeah, for sure. I enjoyed it for sure. Um, so like if you could travel back in time and give young you any advice, what would it be? Wow. Some people won't like this, but I, I stayed away from tall buildings and cubicles and all that kind of stuff and just sort of did my own thing and let my hobbies become jobs. And so both in fishing and skiing, I kind of, I was a ski patrolman and I was, you know, like you were an EMT and all that. I was the EMT too. And so I learned a lot of skills and I had some responsibility, you know, throwing dynamite on the snow banks for avalanches. And so I thought I was just kind of a goofy kid, but, you know, I took things seriously as far as safety and, and uh, being financially okay, you know, never rich, but just covering my bills. And, and so I came to the conclusion after having some money and not having some money that to kids, I, I say the a used phrase, and that is be guided and don't be the guide, but I'm not putting down guides. Guide, I did it. I loved it. My buddies are guides, but I would say, you know, if you've got a good head on your shoulders, um, yeah, get a good career that can, if you want a family and kids and all that, yeah, get a good job do well, hire guides, 
Um, but there's very few really good jobs in fly fishing and skiing and probably a lot of other outdoor sports, but there's sure a lot of fun jobs and you meet the neatest people. But I, I, I still turn, lean to good education, good job, have enough money and investments to have a great, you know, post work life and travel the world and, and do all that. But anyway, so I'm not making my guides mad at me, but they would be happy to know that I want more people to be guided, you know? So, um, yeah, I think kind of doing the straight and narrow, you know, good job, raise good kids and, uh, fish a lot. Very cool. Is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't? Well, I'm a Leo. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're into the signs, huh? No, not really. <laughs> oh no, we could talk forever, but uh I would love to talk probably, with you. Probably better get back to work pretty soon here. I'm I'm a worker today. And uh but it's pretty fun stuff working on some ads for magazines and I'm surrounded by just the coolest, brightest young people. I'm the old guy in the company, you know, there's 400 employees, but I'm by far the oldest. And I enjoy the these young whippersnappers, they're super smart, really hard workers, and they keep me, uh, they keep me in line. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, here's, here's our photo. <laughs> Donnie, that's the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. Oh, you should have seen his face. Let's see if we can. Oh, oh that is gross. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is, this is in, uh. This is in almost Nicaragua, but still Costa Rica. Oh, yeah. I up for some reason. I don't uh, know was that the Oso Peninsula by any chance? Uh, no, no, that's uh, this is this is in the jungle quite a quite a ways. Okay. This is about we we're fishing for tarpon there, and um, oh, yeah, I get you. So you're like you're on the Atlantic side, away from the Caribbean Ocean, right? beautiful place and really really interesting fishery really interesting uh el nino year this year so not a lot of water not a lot of water not a lot of fish right but it was a lot like um it was a lot like steelhead fishing for tarpon is is what it was like so yeah uh would highly recommend it to anybody that is down for a challenge like it was i i think i jumped i jumped three fish had one fish and boated zero it was it was just different like usually i'm pretty good at you know getting good hook sets and all that goofed it every single time because there's so much slack because of the uh the current it just adds another element to it and it's a it's a great learning lesson yeah. oh yeah that'd be fun man i'm gonna let you off of this deal i i hate taking this much of your time but i'm so so uh flattered that you that you hung around for this long uh thank you for everything you've done in fly fishing and i know that they're a bazillion people out there that just absolutely adore you. <laughs> well, I think there's a dozen, but anyway, <laughs> it was great to hang out with you. I, I enjoyed uh, being across the aisle from you at the Denver fly fishing show. Uh -huh. And I still have the bottle opener you gave me with your big rooster fish print on it. So keep doing what you're doing. I love it. Keep Thank the good you. work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, have a great day. And, um, Let's let's talk soon. And serious about the uh, the Arkansas thing. If you want to go fish the white, I got a I got a power drifter that is aching to do it. All right, I'm going to put it on my list. You will not. You'll never I call will me too. <laughs> Have a great day, Brian. Thanks, Donnie. Hi to everybody. <laughs>